But today what I want to do, I want to kind of just, I want to just do a quick review of something before we start today's message. Uh, so many of the things in this message, I've, I've been reminding you on, a, on a, all, multiple times in every service to do what I call check the chip on your shoulder. Why don't you look at someone's shoulder real quick, make sure it's not chipped. Um, and, and the reason I've been saying that throughout this series is that the type of conversations we're having about family discipleship and about parenting, I think they often reveal hidden chips in our shoulders. I think that people are more sensitive about parenting than they are just about anything because we all want to do a terrific job. And when something makes us feel like we're maybe doing less than a terrific job, it's so easy to take it really personally. And then it becomes a conversation different than the conversation I'm trying to lead you through. Are you with me, family? And so I just want to say at the front of this message to check the chip on your shoulder. And to give you clarity, nothing in this series, let me repeat that, nothing in this series is intended to criticize the way you raised your children that are already grown. Nothing in this series is meant to uh, condemn the way you've been parenting up until now and today. Um, nothing about it is to be critical. All the, the only point of this series is to have a biblical perspective on something God has much to talk about, which is parenting and family discipleship, and say, uh, Lord, lead us where you would with your word. Amen, family? From this day forward, with the information we have, we'll do the best we can to do the best we can. Amen? So if you hear anything other than that, uh, let's just call that a lie from the devil. Just cast it off and move forward with the truth conversation we're trying to have. Amen? Amen. All right. So with that being said, today's message, I, th I think, has the greatest potential for a chip on your shoulder. And the next two messages will be the easiest messages, but probably maybe, maybe your favorite one. Next week, we're going to talk about prodigal children. Week after that, we're going to talk about caring for the vulnerable. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about discipline. This is so controversial, my wife jokingly told me, just skip this one. Uh, there's so much controversy. Everybody has an opinion on it. Um, everybody, everybody knows somebody who will criticize the way you do, what your opinion on it. And they're, they're just, it's such a volatile, not just controversial, it's a volatile conversation. Uh, but we're going to do the best we can. So let's give each other lots of grace. Let's just kind of lean in, check the chip, and have some fun. And all God's people said, Amen. all right, let's do this. So, so uh, parenting... Parenting's messy. Discipline might be the messiest part of parenting. It's so messy. It's so complicated. How many parents just absolutely, completely agree? It's so messy. So messy. Uh, when Brittany and I had one kid, I felt like it wasn't easy, but it wasn't nearly as darn difficult as it is with three kids. I can't imagine those of you with wonderful blessings of 7 to 17 kids and how you discipline all 17 of them. Praise Jesus for you and your 17 kids. Um, all kinds of other commentary on that. Good for you. Um, I want 20, but Brittany won't let me. And uh, good for her. <laughs> um, but when we had one, it was easy to keep, keep on track and be consistent and follow through. But then when we went to three, you know, they can all do the same thing wrong. But because Eden's four and Elijah's six over there in the front row, you guys better be good right there. Right there. They did Kidsmen the first service. They're hanging out here in the second service. Everybody say, hey, Elijah and Eden. Hey, Elijah and Eden. Now they're all watching you guys, so you guys be good. Okay? But, you know, they can do the same thing wrong. And then because they're so vastly different in where they're at in life, being four and being almost seven, uh, they deserve completely different methods of discipline because of where they're at in life. It's complicated, even when we're dealing with the same situation. And so I think one of the things we can do to uh, uncomplicate it or, or lessen how complicated it is, let's create a working definition of discipline that comes right out of Scripture. Does that sound good? Let's create a working definition. Here's the one we're going to work with. Discipline is correction driven by love. Let's say that again. Discipline is correction driven by love. One more time. Discipline is correction driven by what? By what? Now, it's so easy for it to accidentally become something different than that, though, isn't it? You know, how, e how parents in the room, how easy is it for, dis for, 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 for discipline to be punishment as the fruit of annoyance, right? Like, love our kids and being, just being honest about it. Like, listen, I just, kids, I love you, but I just need you to chill for 10 minutes. Go to timeout because I just need a minute, right? And by a minute, I mean two days, Okay. <laughs> 
two days of time out, right? Uh, it's so easy for discipline to become something that maybe it shouldn't be, whether it's intentional or accident. It just it can happen. It's maybe punishment as the fruit of annoyance. It can be, um, it can be consequences as the as the overflow of a bad day, right? And we overcorrect because we had a bad. It can just become all these different things. But this is a biblical definition. Look at Hebrews twelve five through six. We're gonna kind of launch here and jump all over the Bible today. But look at what. Hebrews 12, 5 through 6 says, it says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because he disciplines those he loves. In other words, it says, the Lord rebukes you, which is a correction. Why? Because he loves you. Right there, we have a definition of discipline in Scripture that says it is correction driven by love. And then this changes Everything we're da- talking about today. Discipline is no longer just a, uh, this isn't a self-help parenting seminar. This is a spiritual conversation. This is us being shown how God relates to us. This is how we relate to God Almighty. That out of his love for us, he disciplines and corrects and rebukes us. Amen, family? So I want you to see that discipline isn't just a parental conversation. It's a spiritual conversation, and it is correction driven by love. And I cannot stress enough how important this is. You look at uh, Proverbs 19.18, and at first glance, Proverbs 19.18 can look even a little dramatic. It's in your follow-along. Read this. Uh, you don't have to read it aloud, but read it along with me. It says, discipline your son, for in that there is hope, do not be a willing party to his death. That sound a little dramatic? Discipline your kids so that you're not a party, a participant in their death. That sounds incredibly dramatic, but uh, it, it, those of you who've raised kids, right, you know how cr- incredibly true and important this is. When you, when you see your kids grow up, you're like, wow, wow, my, the discipline they got was so important for them. Or you know even yourself, you grew up. And the discipline you you did or did not receive, I'm not saying this to say anything about your parents, but the discipline you did or not did not receive has a huge impact on how you're able to function today. Amen? And so this might sound dramatic, but it's very, very important. In fact, it's so important. Let me let me go back to something we talked about a couple weeks ago. Do you guys remember, those of you here, week one I used this football field analogy. And what happens is uh, when your kids, imagine imagine this is the five-yard line getting ready to store a touchdown going, going this way, okay? And your kids, when they're, when they're small, they have five yards worth of autonomy. They have five yards worth of responsibility. That's because that's the most they their little. Let's maybe say my one year old, for example. He can only handle five yards of responsibility, right? His little little one year old heart and mind and soul can only handle five yards worth of responsibility and autonomy. But because his nature is going to have some rebellion in it, he's going to try everything he can to work his way down the field and try to go from the you know go from the five to the seventy over here. Amen. And my job, because I love him, is to correct him in love and try to keep him over here until he's ready to, until he's ready to move down the field a little bit. Amen? And my goal is I want to see him get really good at the game so that he can work his way down the field. I want to see him grow in skill and in talent and be able to work down in the field. And as he does that... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch him work his way down there, and every time he go- gets down here, maybe at the 50-yard line, for example, I want to know that he, I can trust him to trust God and be fully dependent on God and less dependent on me. Fully dependent on God, able to make good and wise decisions on his own. Amen, family? Until one day, I can, he gets way over here, and he's com- almost completely dependent on God and not me at all. Amen? This is what we do. With discipline, and the reason I bring this analogy back from a couple weeks ago is there is a battle that naturally forms within our households to determine who's in charge of the house. Okay, kids, say amen. Hey, well, all the kids together, one, two, three. Okay, and and it happens naturally. It happens naturally to see who's in charge of the house. 
And, and it's so easy, especially because there, there's, such a, there's such a larger conversation in society about parenting and discipline than there's ever been, right? And there's so much criticism on every side of the conversation, too. And it's so easy to say, I don't want to discipline my kids because I've been told that that's being mean to my kids. And I, I, I feel like that's mean to my kids. And, and it's so easy to kind of go into that. And, and, and it's just what happens is sometimes... It gets flipped, and then our kids can be in charge of the home, and you're at the five-yard line, right? Is that too honest? Now, listen, check the chip on your shoulder. I'm not here criticizing your household. I'm just saying that there's a battle that takes place, and, and I love this quote. There's two quotes, actually, I want to share with you. Uh, this first one, I think, is so powerful. It's in your follow-along. It says, discipline isn't something you do to your child, but something you do for your child. Praise God. God does it for us out of his love for us. It's not something you do to. It's something you do for. Uh, The great theologian Zig Ziglar said this. uh, A child who has not been disciplined with love by his little world will be disciplined without love by the great big world. Right? It's so true. It's so true. And so what I want to do is I want to have a really honest and outgoing conversation on discipline. We're going to talk about lots of different components of discipline, um, some that you're going to love and, and be transformed by, some you might not like and you'll be transformed by. And uh, um, whatever, let's check the chip on your shoulder. Let's have a loving conversation. Let's move forward. Amen? And so what I want to do is, first I want to just pick on parents a little bit, myself included. I want to show you uh, three types of undisciplined parents. And uh, just to be clear, All of us have a little bit of some of them, okay? Current company included. All of us have some degree of some of them. Uh, This isn't for condemnation purposes. This is just to create some self-awareness in the room, okay? So here's the first one I want to point out. The first one is what we call the lifeguard parents. The lifeguard parents. What's a lifeguard parent do? A lifeguard parent uh, often rescues a child from consequences, Okay, now, now hold on. Um, when I say rescue a child from consequences, I'm not saying don't rescue your child from danger. I'm saying there's a difference between saving your child from, from getting hit by a bus versus saving your child from some natural consequences of life, right? And this is what a lifeguard parent does. Lots of examples of this. But first, let's, let's look at, uh, no, let's just look at some examples really quick. So like, um, your kid gets in trouble at school. Let's make up a grade. Let's say they're a first grader, okay? And you get a call from the school, and you have determined before you even got there, on your way there, you know that your kid didn't do nothing wrong because you know what the other kid that probably you're assuming was the culprit because of the stories you heard. So you just know on your way there that none of it was your kid's fault. And when you go in there and you meet with the teacher, you have predetermined that your kid will have no consequences and no trouble because it wasn't your kid's fault and you will rescue them from any consequences regardless of how guilty they are or not. How many people can relate to some lifeguard parenting tendencies? Okay? There's more, there's more, you know, and and it doesn't just have to be when they're in trouble. It could be, um, you know, little Johnny forgot his lunch three days in a row. You know, you're a sack lunch family. He forgot his lunch three days in a row. Bada bing, bada boom, that's where you're at. Uh, The problem is uh, little Johnny's not a first grader anymore. He's a sophomore in college because you have built a habit of rescuing Johnny from everything all the time. And Johnny just never learned the lesson that sometimes if you forget your lunch, you don't eat. Right? Lifeguard, parent, lifeguard, parent, lifeguard, parent. Now, why is this so important that we let our kids face consequences? Why is this? Well, God tells us in his word, Galatians 6, 7, it says what? Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Right? So, in other words, in God's economy, there is a system of consequence for actions, right? And I don't want to be Mr. Prosperity Gospel or anything, but there's also a system of, re- of reward for obedience, right? Uh, there, there's, a, there's promises in Scripture that says, obey the word of the Lord, and then there's blessings associated with obedience, and then there's also uh, several instances that say, hey, disobedience, you reap what you sow, natural consequences, 
In fact, the commandment that says, honor your mother and father, talking about parenting, what's it say? It says there's a blessing associated with it, right? This is, this is a theme throughout Scripture. Why? Because this is God's economy for his universe. God's economy for his universe. Um, and, and I just want to be really honest and transparent. This is the one that I'm most tempted with, right? Uh, this is mine, and I hope you figure out which one you're most vulnerable to. As I go through these three, I hope you check that chip on your shoulder. Um, the 9 o'clock service was so quiet, it was almost eerie. You could hear a pin drop if there was ever silence from the microphone because everybody is just so laser-focused on this. I want, you, I want this to be a, a serious but light conversation that we can just receive with joy. Amen? Because uh, I know here's what I know about every single parent in here. You're doing the best you can to do the best you can. And the last thing you need is someone to come and rub your nose in everything that you already beat yourself up for, okay? So check the chip on your shoulder. All this is for is for self-awareness purposes, not condemnation. But the first one is life guard parenting. Um, you know, we, let's pick on the lunch money example a little bit more. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you give your kid lunch money, and then they use it to go and, um, I don't know, buy, some, buy a video game. They've been saving up their lunch money to buy video games or something, you know. And uh, then you realize that they come and they give you this sob story of, hey, I, I don't have any lunch money in my account. Mom, uh, I'm pretty sure I just gave you enough to fill it for the whole semester. Um, no, I bought this video game. And, and the reality is it might be good for them to go a couple days without lunch. I know the school wouldn't let that happen probably. But uh, either way, it might be good for them to learn the consequence of misusing it. Why? Well, fast forward this way farther into the future. The kids need to learn how to manage their money. And this is a good opportunity to get started. Amen? Lifeguard parenting. In fact, uh, there's other things that, that are good when our kids don't get lifeguarded too much. Uh, oddly enough, um, uh, my, my son didn't pass his level three swimming lessons the other day. And it's the first time he, fa- he didn't pass at something. And I was so grateful for that because he learned that there's something that won't come easy that he gets to work harder at, right? That, that failing can happen and it's okay because now I have an opportunity to push on something when, especially when, like this kid's amazing. Everything comes so easy for him, right? He's just blessed. He's just good at everything. And it's good for him to experience there's a consequence that sometimes it's just a natural consequence of having to work a little harder at something. Amen? Amen? So lifeguard parenting. Let's go to another one. Um, let's call this the uh, let's call this the Etch-a-Sketch parent. The Etch-a-Sketch parent. Um, do you guys, everybody know what an Etch-a-Sketch is? Does anybody not know what an Etch-a-Sketch is? All right, so an Etch-a-Sketch was, is this beautiful little device. Um, it's one of the greatest pieces of technology in history of, of, of ever, okay? And it's this, amen? It's beautiful piece of technology. So what it is, it's this little box, and there's these two little knobs, and you would turn the knobs to draw pictures. And if you could draw a circle in the square, I tell you what, you were a hero among men and women, right? If you could draw circles on the, because it don't happen. Okay, but what would happen when you play with the Etch-A-Sketch and you shake it, everything disappears. That's how you erase it. You draw with the knobs, you shake it, and erase it. And this is what sometimes happens with our parenting. Um, what happens is you have some lines drawn in the household. Here's the five-yard line, um, and, and here's the boundaries that are set. But then from day to day, uh, there's a massive inconsistency. Etch-a-sketch parents are often inconsistent. And so yesterday it was the five-yard line. Today it's the 70-yard line, right? And, and the boundaries change and they move frequently. And honestly, your kid has a whiplash because they can't keep track of where the boundaries really are especially because it's their nature to push the boundaries, okay? And so they push the boundary. The boundary was here. They successfully pushed it to there. Now they think this is the new boundary, but then you push them back, and it's incredibly confusing, especially if you consider how much study shows how much kids love order and discipline. And now, kids in the room, none of you are going to say, I want my parents to discipline me, are you? Kids, kids you want to get away with everything you can, right? But the reality is, if you got away with everything you can, all the studies show that you would wish your kids, your parents were more strict with you. There's so much study on it that says kids love 
order and discipline. Some, some of the best studies show that kids who act out, um, really what they want is their parent to show them that they love them enough to be in trouble. By the way, I was that kid all my teenage years. Well, early teenage years, I was horrible. And honestly, it would have been so nice just to have some discipline, okay? And, and it's just, there's ample research. You can go research it yourself. I'm not going to flood you with it. But this, there's this inconsistency. Now, now look at uh, Proverbs 29, 15, and 17. It says, the rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a child left to himself disgraces his mother. Discipline your son, and he will give you peace. He will bring you delight to your soul. Now, what it doesn't say is discipline them today and not tomorrow. There's an attitude of consistent discipline. There's an attitude of a lifestyle of consistent, predictable discipline. And I love that. I love that last part. He will bring delight to your soul. And so a lot of our kids, they just want to know where the lines are. And when the line moves all the time, they're constantly trying to figure out where the new lines are at. Do we understand the undisciplined parent? Okay. Uh, is anybody, all right, how many people you can relate to the lifeguard parent? It's okay. You, we're, this is a safe place. How many of you can relate to the Etch-a-Sketch parent? Okay, let's, let's do one more, one more. Um, the ne- last one is called the ununified parent. The ununified. Let, no, let's go back to the undisciplined parent. Because um, I want to ha- show you, there, there's empathy and sympathy with that one, right? Like, it's so easy to be that. I, I'm, I'm vulnerable to that one too, right? Especially, like, when, when you have a good day, it's easy to, be, you know, you're, you're well rested, you had a good day, and, and you're like, all right, I'm ready to deal with everything today. I'll, every battle that's worth fighting, I'm going to fight. You know, I'm going to be express loving kindness. I'm going to be patient. I'm going to be gentle. I'm going to be decisive. I'm going to be authoritative. And, and you can just do all the stuff all the way, all the time, right? And then, then like, hopefully you, can't tell very, hopefully you can't tell very well right now, but I have a little bit of a cold I'm fighting through to, to be here with you today, and I feel horrible. Uh, and sometimes when you feel horrible, it's just like, you know what? It's just easier not to deal with it. <laughs> Right, it would just be so much easier today. Just like, hey, you know what? Uh, anything goes today. I know I said you were grounded yesterday, but you know what? Just get out of here. Go have some fun. You'll be grounded tomorrow, and then tomorrow comes, and you know, the grounding's done, right? Um, because it's really easy to just have a, you know, maybe a bad day at work, or you're sick, or or you know, you and you know your significant other, or you know, you're having a little bit of a quarrel, or you know, maybe you 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 thought that. You thought about it, and you wish you the, the punishment was different the day before, and you just want to redraw the lines. Like, it makes sense. This etch-a-sketch makes sense, but uh, being overtly inconsistent is not good or healthy for our kids. Amen? Here's the last one. I promise I'll, I'll stop with this one, and we'll go to the next part of the message. But um, split decision parenting is the next one. Split decision parenting. Um, what that is, it's, it's often an ununified front. It's an ununified front. Uh, Go to Amos 3.3. It says, do two walk together unless they have what? Unless they have agreed to do so. Um, One of the most important things we can do for our kids is be a unified front. And I just want to pause right here and acknowledge the messiness of life, right? Uh, Let's acknowledge the absolute messiness of life. Some of you are in situations where, you know what, you're a mom or a dad and, and things didn't work out. And you're no longer together. And you have different philosophies of life. Uh, some of you, you have blended families. And that's really complicated. It's like, these are my kids. And these are your kids. And together, they're our kids. And there's, you know, there's potentially three families involved in this blended family at that point, right? And th- there's so many, so much complication to this. So all I want to do is just start by saying, let's do the best we can to do the best we can as we unpack this point, And let's acknowledge how complicated it is, all right? Remember, check the chip on your shoulder. Let's just acknowledge how complicated it is. Um, but h- here's the reality. Um, if you need to disagree, th- you have control over this part. I don't, I don't care how messy it is. You do have control over this part. Um, if you have to disagree, you can choose to disagree behind closed doors. Kids don't need to see you disagree. You can choose to disagree behind closed doors. And you can own your part. And you can even, especially if you're in a messy situation where, where you just don't have a clean relationship with the person um, who's, you know, who's the other parent, um, you can go, and this will make them feel so good. You can tell them these words, say, I promise you will never hear me say anything negative to our kids about you. 
And you can contribute positively to a potentially negative situation by just making those simple statements. And you can begin to build a united front. Now, Brittany and I, we were married for eight years before the Lord blessed us with kids. And, uh, and what was, I, I just, I was never going to do this. And then one, time, one day this happened. So even inside of a, you know, non-blended family or everybody's together in the house. Um, one day, one day the kids looked at me for clarity on something. And I, I just, I was never going to do this, you guys. Ever. But then one day, um, kids wanted to do something. And I didn't think it was a big deal. And Brittany thought it was a big deal. And I would, just didn't want to battle out with Brittany on whether it was a good deal or not. And so I said some of the dumbest things I've ever said in all of my 14 years of marriage. You guys ready for this? Here's what I said to my kids. Your mom doesn't want you to. (laughs) A mom up in the front row says that's a couch night. (laughs) Listen, take those words out of your vocabulary. You are going to agree on it. Even if you guys decide and you figure out, you know, who, who get, who's the ultimate veto person. And establish that in the relationship. Who gets to make the veto decisions, right? Who gets to make the veto decisions? You know, we have an executive board in the church. And, and there's, there's five of them on the board. And kind of my personal rule, if, they, if three of them vote for something that I disagree with, I'll usually concede to the group. Uh, but but I, they know I have veto power if there's, I have a really, 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 really good reason to say, hey, listen, I, I know strategically we have to go this way instead. Uh, we, have a, we have a meeting in our, we have a rule in our leadership team that says um, when we have a meeting, by the way, I've never had to veto anything because you have an awesome board, but uh, then whenever we have a leadership meeting, we have this r- rule that says in the meeting, you are encouraged to disagree and argue if necessary. In the meeting, bring it, bring the heat, let's go. As, as long as it's a valid argument, let's, let's have the argument. Don't argument just because you feel like this is a safe place to argue and you got to get out of your system. Come on, Abe. Come on. He, yeah, just speaking on Abe. He's in the front. He's one of our board members. Um, but, no, if there's an appropriate argument. But when the meeting ends, listen to me. When the meeting ends, nobody is allowed to run around the church talking about how they disagreed. They have to own the decision made in the meeting after the meeting's done. And if they go around saying, yeah, the leaders voted on this, but, but I was not for it, uh, they will get disciplined, <laughs> pastoral disciplined, okay? Do the same thing in your parenting, right? Like, hey, you can disagree, you can disagree, but afterwards, figure out who has veto power, figure out how to come up to the conclusion that you need to come up to, and then afterwards, own it own it. And now it's not, mom doesn't want you to. It's like, hey, here's our decision. It's us. It's we. It's us. It's we. It's us. It's we. It's us. It's we. Why? Because not, not just for your spouse or not just because of, you know, the, the other parent involved if you're not together. Do it because it's good for your kids. Amen? It is good for your kids. So I want to kind of shift gears here, but I want to make sure that we've kind of, these points have landed. These are three common uh, undisciplined parenting models that all of us probably have some of. Why did I share this with you? To beat up how you parent your kids? Everybody say no. No. Did I say this to beat up how you parent your kids? No. No. We say that just for self-awareness. We can can figure out where we're vulnerable, and then as the Lord reveals where we're vulnerable, we can move forward and what? Grow. Amen? I'm assuming that's what everybody wants. Everybody wants to grow the most you can to do the best you can for who you can do the best for. Amen? So what I want to do is, is I want to show you that the, these three points, the lifeguard parent, which often rescue from consequence, the etch-a-sketch parent, which is often is inconsistent, the split decision parent, who's often ununified, your kids should be able to expect the opposite from you. Right? Your kids should expect, be able to expect you to allow them to experience consequence. Your kids should expect you to be cons- consistent. Your kids should expect you to be unified. And then likewise, what I want to do is shift gears and show you three expectations you should be able to have of your kids. Okay? So here's three things 
that you should be able to expect from your kids, all biblical principles. The first one, though, you might think I made up. You might think that uh, this is just a dream in la-la land. But the first one, you should be able to expect this from your kids. We expect first time and cheerful obedience. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Right? First time and joy and cheerful obedience. Uh, and, and this is actually in Scripture. Uh, Colossians 3.20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Again, this isn't just a parenting talk. This is spiritual. God delights in healthy parent-child relationships. God delights in healthy children-parent relationships. God delights in our relationships with our family looking like he, he wants our relationship with him to look. Amen? And so he adds that phrase in there that says, for this pleases the Lord. And then even, even go to Philippians 2.14. It says, do everything without complaining or grumbling. Like this type of language is sprinkled throughout Scripture where God wants us to ourselves be cheerfully obedient and teach our kids to be cheerful, cheerfully obedient. So notice what it doesn't say. Can I have all the kids pay really close attention for a second, all the kids in the room? Like, it doesn't say, wait till dad counts to three and a half when he said he was going to count to three. Right? It doesn't say that. It doesn't say, wait until mom chewed you out. Does it say that, kids? It doesn't say, wait till mom chews you out. It says, just obey your parents. Do everything without complaining or grumbling. Um. We've, we've had to establish this in our household, and it, it's taken some work, but we're, we're mostly there. Do we expect our kids to be perfect? No. We want to have realistic expectations. Our kids are pretty good at this. Um, we, uh, I teach my kids, they say, they're supposed to say, yes, sir, or yes, mama, when we're serious. Um, we play and we joke a lot, and so sometimes we have to shift gears and get serious. And uh, they don't, mom doesn't like yes, ma'am, so we do yes, mama. Um, I like yes, sir, and sometimes, sometimes when we're having a good day, I get yes, sir, sergeant, daddy, sir, and that one, that one travels, okay? That one goes the distance, um, and, and our kids have been taught in loving conversation that when mom and dad say something, and they can tell when we're playing versus when we're serious, when we're serious, they're expected to say, yes, sir, sergeant, daddy, sir, and then go do it. They are expected to say, Yes, mama, in the cutest way they can, and then go do it. And that doesn't mean it's perfect. There's constant coaching on it. I had to, uh, the other day, we were having dinner at the dinner table, and mama was talking to Elijah about something. And Elijah, he, uh, he didn't look like he was listening, but he was. But in his mind, he just made up his own way of responding, but it looked like he's ignoring his mom. And I do not tolerate my kids disrespecting their mama like that. So, we're sitting at the dinner table together, and I say, Elijah, what would your mom just say? And then he quotes her perfectly. <laughs> Little punk, acting like he's not paying attention. <laughs> See, he's doing it right now, right there. He's like, yes, I am. And, uh, and so he perfectly quotes his mom, even though it looked like he was in la-la land. And then I'm like, what would your mom say? He's like, he said what she said. And I'm like, well, when are you going to do it? He's like, I'm going to do it as soon as I'm done doing whatever he was doing. And I said, now, first of all, this was a beautiful conversation. Uh, but I said, no, you need to do it when your mom tells you to do it. Now, this is where it becomes beautiful. Like, just because we had this conversation, like, I'm not even having to discipline him. All it was was reestablishing the drawn boundary. Amen? I didn't have, the boundary didn't move. He knew where the boundary was, but in his mind, he kind of, he tried to, he tried to move it in a way that wasn't even, uh, it wasn't even built out of disobedience. He just came up with his own idea, but we had to establish, no, mom's idea is the idea we're going to go with, even if your idea is really good. And we got to explain why, and I just got to have this beautiful conversation with my son and say, hey, you know what, uh, when your mama asks you to do something, I need you to do it when she asks you to do it. And we just, we bonded over that, amen? The reason I'm sharing this story is, is some of this discipline stuff doesn't have to be messy, you know, Board, uh, this is too extreme, but it doesn't have to be messy, borderline, uh, you know, violent, right? And I think that's sometimes how the picture of discipline in our mind is just like things have escalated, things are out of control, everything's chaos, and, and you know, like, like it's just, 
it's just this messy thing. No, this, this was actually a very innocent, kind, loving conversation where discipline grew in our house. Amen? And we can have these conversations just by being consistent and clear. Um, and, and what I want to do is I want to I give you some really, really powerful advice on this. Um, what we want to do is we want to discipline more for attitude than actions. Amen? Amen. Say attitude, attitude. Over, action. over action. Say attitude, attitude. Over, action. over action. Okay, we want to shoot for attitude over action. So, and, and this is super cliche, but I think it will deliver the point. You know, um, dad comes home from work. Mom's parenting the kids. Dad walks in on the kids mouthing off to mama. And dad says, hey, you need to stop mouthing off to your mom. And kids, let's say it's a son named Elijah or something, says, I wasn't mouthing off to my mom. I said, yes, you were. He says, no, I wasn't. Say, yes, you were. No, I wasn't. If you mouth off one more time, you're going to go to your room. Well, fine. No, I wasn't. (laughs) Yes, you were. Go to your room. No. No. Go to your room. Fine. Stomp, 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 slam door. What happened there? It's so, it's, it's so cliche to say, you know, to, want to see that happen in a movie or something, and dad sits down with kind of the attitude. It's like, yeah, I showed him. No, you didn't show him nothing. You had outward uh, obedience, but you had inward rebellion. That's not our goal, amen? Our goal is to what? Our goal is to have correction driven by love, which insinuates growing healthy relationship, not inward rebellion accompanying outward obedience. Amen? And so some of these conversations are so wonderful because what we get to do is we get to establish growing inward obedience. That's the goal. Our goal is to get them to want to cheerfully immediately obey. Hallelujah. And, and it can happen. It can happen. It's not going to be per- perfect, but it can happen. Um, and then this leads to the second, the second thing that we can expect from our kids or we can agree to for our kids. We agree to never discipline in anger. Amen? We agree to never discipline in anger. Ephesians 4.26 says, in your anger do not sin. We want joyful first time obedience. And when you don't get that, we are not going to discipline in anger. Now, sometimes we want to, amen? Sometimes there's a lot of anger to be had, amen? amen? How many people had to watch the Sound of Purple when you had a kid? Man, they, they do this video in the hospital when you have your first-time kid nowadays, and it's this video that's um, basically discouraging shaken baby syndrome. Um, and it's this beautiful, well-done video that I thought was really cheesy until, until I actually started parenting. And I'm like, never mind, this is really helpful. Um, but it basically talks about... There's this, there's this threshold when you're parenting, and you can handle so much annoyance before you just feel like you're just going to explode. In the video, it talks about, you know, severe crying when the kids don't stop crying, and that triggers something inside you, and they say, you know what, just go put your kid in the crib. It's okay if they're crying. Just go put them in the crib, let them cry for five minutes so you can calm down, and then you can go back and then be loving instead of, you know, raging while you're trying to love them while you're, you know, all balancing all that stuff. We okay, family? Like... We're all being honest. We all have the complicated emotions. We love our kids. You're great parents, but we have complicated lives, right? In our anger, we will not discipline. We will not do that. And, and I want to just say this. I'm, I wanna, this is the most controversial thing. Brittany jokingly kind of told me she said, just don't do it, honey. But uh, let's talk about spanking for a minute, okay? In your anger, do not sin. Let's talk about spanking. Uh, Till the day I die, I will say that spanking is a biblically correct, even if it's not a politically correct form of parenting. But I will add this caveat that most spanking is bad and some spanking is terrific. Let me say that again. Most spanking is bad and uncalled for. Some spanking is terrific. Now, the way we do it in our house, and this is just the way we do it, uh, we have a three-tier discipline system. So uh, things that are, that are this bad... They get a verbal coaching is what we'll call it. Uh, and if it's it, it may be a loving conversation, like I just modeled for you when Elijah's not listening to his mama during dinner. If, if it's bad, then it gets a scolding. We'll never yell at them, but they'll get a scolding. And I can't do it because my voice is under the weather right now, but I'd have a, I have a dad voice that I'll use. I just can't, it hurts to do that. <laughs> but then the dad voice will come out. And there will be a scolding. 
And if it's worse than a scolding level of disobedience, they go to timeout. And in our household, timeout is the closest thing to hell that the kids can imagine. We do not like timeout in the Mueller house. It is a terrible place to be where there are no rainbows and there's no color and all joy is sucked out of the world in the land of timeout. Okay? Now, sometimes we'll take things away or add responsibilities. That's kind of an outlier. Usually it's scolding or timeout. And then level three discipline, that's where the spanking comes in. But most spanking is unnecessary, just in my opinion. Uh, when we spank, here's how, here's how it has to happen. Number one, they are warned ahead of time that they will be spank- receive X number of spankings for doing Y. They will know how many. And they have to, I can't be angry, and they can't be angry, and they have to come and receive it. (laughs) They have to know exactly why they're going to come and receive it. And they have to come and willingly receive it. It's always less than 10. I think we've never gone more than 7. And I'll tell you, I've only spanked my kids probably five times in their whole life. Because most things don't need it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, um, I think that's biblically correct to do it, if necessary. I think most of the time it can be handled with scolding, with timeout, or something else that's creative and driven by love. What's interesting is there's so much criticism of discipline. That's why I said repeatedly to check the chip on your shoulder. Amen, family? Um, and there's so much study on this. There's, there's so much study, um, that, and we're, we're a couple generations into the non-spanking uh, generations of parenting. And, and if all the studies were correct, then we should have some of the most well-behaved, well-disciplined members of society today. But it seems like a lot of the problems that spanking is supposed to cause have not disappeared with the absence of spanking. I just want to throw that out there. Uh, the, all the, a lot of the studies say that uh, spanking leads to acting out, depressed, vulnerable, suicidal, um, angry kids. But it seems like those things are just as common in the era of non-spanking. What I will show you really quick uh, is there's a couple studies that have separated different types of physical punishment from appropriate uh, and infrequent spanking. So there's one study that uh, surveyed 2,600 people and included interviews with 179 teen- teenagers they concluded that children spanked by their parents may perform better at school and grow up to be happier than those who don't receive such punishment. Now, in that study, it was specifically spanking and not other types of physical punishment. There's another study that used the wording infrequent spanking. And a lot of the studies you see that kind of knock on this, um, they include all forms of physical punishment. It says infrequent spanking showed healthy results in kids. Why? Most spanking is probably unnecessary, but some spanking is terrific. And here's kind of the bottom line in all this. In your anger, do not sin. Okay? Um, Your kids don't need spanked for everything they do. And I'll say this with as much authority as I can muster with my weak voice today. But I'll tell you what. uh, If you hit your kids, repent right now and never do it again. If you're a person who hits your kids... In inappropriate ways, repent right now, find help, and so help me, never do it again. Because in our sin, do not, in our anger, do not sin. Discipline's good. Spanking can be good. If the Lord leads you to do that, do it well. If not, then don't worry about it. I'm not here to tell you you need to spank your kids. I'm telling you, love your kids. Because discipline is correction guided by love. And all God's people said, Number three, we discipline promptly and with instruction and reconciliation. Uh, Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So, so this is what we do with our kids, right? The first thing we do is like, hey, what was wrong? Hey, why would you do that? <coughs> right? We want to make up. Hey, uh, I, I, it's amazing. It's amazing making up with a kid after they've been punished, right? Amen? Hey, you guys, it's one of the sweetest things. Why? Because really what they want to do, especially when they're, they're little, or, all they want to do is do the right thing by you. That's why they need clarity and reconciliation. Amen? That's why you're not, you're not, they're not going to be in trouble 10 hours from what they did 10 hours ago. It needs to be addressed as quickly as possible because they want to do a good job. It's in their nature to please you. 
They want it, so they need instruction and reconciliation. I mean, I tell you what, the, one of the, like the third time of the five times I spanked my son and he hugged me afterward, I, it was just one of the purest moments of, of relationship we had where he understood, he's like, I realized that was bad and I need to never do that again. Right, Dad? Right, son. And it worked. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. I want to go back to one of the verses that we talked about a little bit ago. Um, Discipline your son, for in it there is hope. Do not be a willing party to his death. What is, what is discipline? It's correction driven by love. It's not something we do to our kids. It's something we do for our kids. Amen, family? This is good. This is so good. This is so good. And this is us. This is who we are. Amen? We are Christ-centered families, building a firm found, putting, lay, building our family on the firm foundation of Jesus. Amen? And in our relationship with Jesus, he disciplines those he loves. If he did not love us, it would not be so. We're going to discipline those we love. It will be driven by love and nothing else. And we will strive to make it about love and nothing else. This is who we are. This is what we're going to do. It's not something we do to them. It's something we do for them. And here's what happens. Okay, are you ready for this? Disciplined kids become disciplined adults. But it's a different kind of discipline. The kids who receive discipline well, loving, correction well. Kids, listen, if you receive discipline well, what happens is you grow up and become disciplined. And that's a whole different word entirely. Disciplined kids become disciplined adults. Disciplined kids become adults who can say no to bad things with confidence because you know better. Disciplined kids can say yes to challenging things that would be easy to give up on. Why? Because you've experienced what it was like to want to do something, but have to tell yourself no because your parents taught you that you say no to bad things and you say yes to good things. And so disciplined kids become disciplined adults, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to raise up a generation of disciplined, who, disciplined kids who grow up to be disciplined adults and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Amen, family? We'll say yes to the difficult thing of sharing Jesus with everybody at school, at work, and everywhere we go. We're going to say no to sin, horrible things. We're going to say no to horrible things that the devil makes look good. Why? Because we're disciplined. It's who we are. This is us. Amen, family? And so, Father God, I pray that you would grow the discipline at Restore, that you would transform and change lives, that we would look at where we're undisciplined parents and not, not, not let us feel guilt and shame, that we would feel freedom to acknowledge and to grow. Father, that where we're divided, we would overcome our division. Where we're inconsistent, we would replace it with consistency. When we, I, I, when, we, when we discipline out of anger, that we would replace that with love and kindness and gentleness and goodness and peace and patience and self-control and all the fruit of the Spirit, Father. And Father, right now, if there's, if there's somebody here who, who needs to just commit to being a disciplined follower of you, I pray right now they would just open up their hearts and just say, Jesus, I've been, I've been doing this apart from you all this time. I'm ready to do it for you. I'm ready to do it in faith. Jesus, I'm ready to do this right now, and I submit to your authority. I want to receive your discipline. I want to be a member of your family. Adopt me into your family right now. I put my faith in you, Jesus, that you died on the cross to wash away my sins, and I am yours. I put my faith in you. I give you my life. You conquered the grave, and when you conquered the grave, you brought me back to life. I am yours. I put my faith in you. I am yours. I am yours. I am yours, and you are mine. And Father, if somebody just gave their heart to you right now, I pray that they don't leave without making themselves known. I pray that you would glorify yourself through the families here who are willing to have difficult conversations. And God, we pray that you're glorified in all of this, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen.